So welcome back. We have spent a fair amount of time looking at reasoning, looking at theorem proving of ways of proving theorems and so on. We have looked at some different languages like proportional logic and first order logic and discussed how theorem proving happens in that. Now let us focus a little bit on representation. If you want to model the world in which you are operating, how do you represent the world essentially? In particular, we are interested in representation in first order logic. So, having chosen this language for representation and also for reasoning, uh, the task now is to choose an appropriate set of predicate names because if you remember first order logic is basically centered around predicates uh, which are basically relations on the domain, relations on elements in the domain. The first set of predicates we shall look at describe relations between what are noun phrases in natural language, so individuals in the domain and then we will think about how to talk about verbs. Verbs are a little bit trickier because verbs have multiple relations, there is an agent, there is an action, there is a precondition of action, there are effects of actions and things like that essentially. We begin with the style of the logic community, choosing names that make sense to us because we can focus on how the connectives and quantifiers fit in to whatever we are trying to represent. We have mentioned reification at various times. Basically, it means that you include in the domain some abstract entities which in some sense are not part of the domain essentially. So, as discussed uh, in the introduction, uh, we humans represent knowledge at a conceptual level which is at an abstract level much above the fundamental particles the world is really made up of. So, even when we do that choosing people for example, as our level of representation we talk about individuals like Mary and John and Peter. Uh, we may still need to introduce more abstract elements, for example, teams of people, organizations, nations and so on and we will as, as we will see soon introduce terms like units of measurement and colors and so on. How do we represent such things? For the moment, we will assume that we can represent predicates chosen conveniently from natural language and focus on how to represent knowledge with them. So, let us begin with the implication statement because in a way it is the often misunderstood statement. So, let us say that we have a statement P implies Q which is there added to our knowledge base. As I said, it is often misunderstood and the primary reason for this misunderstanding is that we tend to think of it as a causal relation we tend to think of it as saying that P causes Q essentially, whereas logically speaking that is not the case. So, if you say P, if P then Q, it in logic it does not mean that P causes Q, in logic it means that if P is true then Q must also be true, which is also read as Q if P, that Q will be true if P is true. If we think of it in a modified form because we know that P implies Q can be written as not P or Q, then that causal connection somehow does not figure into our thinking essentially. So, if you think of it as not P or Q, then here we are saying that at least one of not P and Q must be true essentially, that is all we are saying or which is equivalent to say that P can be true only if Q is also true because if Q is false, P must be false because the sentence has to be true. So, Q is a necessary condition for P to be true. So, whenever we say P implies Q, we often mean, we often say that Q is a necessary condition for P essentially, which means that P, if Q is, it is necessary that Q be true for P to be true essentially, because if P is true and Q is false, P implies Q would not be true. On the other hand, if P is true, Q 
must be true. If you look at the truth table, then as we will see in a moment again, you will see that that is the case. So, we say that P is a sufficient condition for Q to be true. If P is true, then it is sufficient to say that Q is true. Of course, Q can be true even when P is not true. Essentially. We will look at these examples now. So, when is the statement P implies Q true? You can look at the truth table, it has got four rows in it and we will consider each of those four rows. P implies Q is true when both P and Q are true, that is one row in that. So, for example, P could be the earth is round, Q could be the lychee is a fruit, both are true. P could be the ball is heavy and Q could be someone loves her mother, again both are true. But as I said, we do not see a causal connection here between P and Q. That it is not that because the ball is heavy that someone loves her mother. Logically, we are saying that if P is true, then Q has to be true. Now, clearly it is up to us users to input meaningful implication statements into our logic. Really. Because if you just take arbitrary two things which are true, and then connect them up with the implication, it does not help us very much. Now, P implies Q is also true when both P and Q are false. This is as per the truth table that we here we are looking at. So, for example, the earth is flat and Q is the moon is made of corn flour essentially. Now, if we know Q to be false, we can use P implies Q to infer that P also must be false. And we do that when we use the rule of modus tollens essentially, which says that given P implies Q and given not Q, you can infer not P essentially. It is also used in the proof by contradiction as we have seen essentially. Another case when P implies Q is true is when P is false and Q is true. For example, the earth is flat and 7 is bigger than 6. But the last two statements when both when P is true and Q is false or Q is true, they cannot be used in uh, uh, when P is false and, and Q can be false or true, cannot be used in modus ponens because modus ponens requires that P to be true. But as we saw, one of them can be used in modus tollens. Lastly, the fourth row of the implication truth table says P implies Q is false when P is true and Q is false. For example, the earth is round and 7 is smaller than 6. But we are not really interested in this case very much because if P implies Q is false, we would not add it to the knowledge base because we have said that the knowledge base consists of a set of premises or axioms that is given to you essentially. So, we are only interested in true statements. So, what about the first order case? When we say for all x, p x implies q x. For example, we have seen that all men are mortal is written like this. For all x, man x implies mortal x. Now, p implies q is false when p is true and q is false. The FOL version which is for all x, p x implies q x can be seen as a conjunct over the entire knowledge base. So, it is just a short form for saying p of a 1 implies q of a 1 and p of a 2 implies q of a 2 and so on up to the last element a n essentially. So, it would help sometimes to think of it as a big conjunct. Now, we cannot afford to have for all x, p x implies q x in your knowledge base and also have an instance a where p of a is true and not q of a is also true which means q of a is false. Even for one element if there is such an instance then our knowledge base will become inconsistent. So, here is the example. The first statement is equivalent to saying 
for all x, bird x implies fly x, flies x and in resolution we would see that we can derive the null clause which means that the original set of clauses which are those three cl clauses that we have drawn there is unsatisfiable or inconsistent. And we have also seen that we do not like inconsistent knowledge bases because you can derive anything from a, a, a contradiction. But this is useful knowledge to have to know that birds fly essentially. You know, we use this knowledge all the time. It is just that we cannot make it like a universal statement that for all x, bird x implies fly x, x because there may be some bird which cannot fly essentially. We will investigate how to incorporate such useful generalizations that birds fly later in the course essentially. So, generalizations are different from universal statement. Universal statements say that for every x this must be true. Generalization says that in general it is true. So, you allow for exceptions. So, let us also talk about adding this uh, first order implication to the sentence. So, this is going to be true when p is false and q is true. Again, we can think of it as a conjunct. So, it will help us understand what we are talking about. Now, if it is true that p x is false for every x, which means for all x not p of x is true, which is another way of saying that there does not exist an x such that p x is true, which means that p a is true is false for every a which belongs to the domain for every a which belongs to the domain p a is false. Now, if that was the case that there is no element which satisfies p a, then we can jolly well go ahead and write such a statement with any predicate q and the statement will turn out to be true because we know that p implies q is true when p is false and q is true. So, if p is going to be false anyway, then you can write any anything on this on the right hand side of q. So, for example, we could write that uh, all honest politicians are immortal. Now, if there are no honest politicians, which is what this example is saying, then this generalization is vacuously true or this universal statement is vacuously true and it is may be true, but it is a harmless flight of fancy because we cannot prove that there is some immortal person there. We will if, if somebody says that is there an immortal person then one would say you show me an honest politician and I will show you an immortal person and but if there is no honest politician then no that is all. So, that is another case of uh, this thing. Now, we have said that all men are mortal for example and uh, one of them is a category, man is a category, it is a subset, it is a class, it is a kind of thing whereas, mortality is a property essentially, it is a property of certain entities that they are mortal. I mean we have a slight distinction between categories and, and, and properties, but in first order logic we treat them as the same. When we write that for all x man x implies mortal x, we just think of them the interpretation of that both of these uh, predicates is a subset of the domain essentially. So, we have seen this example earlier, man is a category mortal is a property, but we treat it like a category. So, it is it is as if that we are thinking of a class of all mortal entities essentially. Whereas, you know we would like to conceptually think of it as a property of men and dogs and cats and so on essentially. The subset relation is captured by the implication. So, when you say for all x, man x implies mortal x, then the interpretation of that is that this, this image of man under the interpretation is a subset of the image of mortal under the inter interpretation.
binaric predicates capture relations between individuals. So, this is about unary predicates. More interesting predicates are bin binary predicates and uh, we shall look at them in the next video.